I've finished that section on um, acceleration. Of course, there is much more to be said, as there is for all of the things that I've been talking about. Um, but I want to, to go back to something else that we just mentioned in one of the previous lectures. Um, I think one of you asked a question, and I probably said I promised to answer that question in the future. And so here it is. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what's called the metric. I'm not going to say very much, I'm just going to write it down basically. So <coughs> we're in um, R4 and we're going to write our vectors uh, like this, x0, x1, x2 and x3. And remember that these are not powers, they're labels. Okay. We're going to write it that easy too. Um, there, it's more logical to have them as uh, <laughs> superscripts, actually. But I agree, you have to remember that they're not powers. Okay. And so I agree that if I want, if, if I really want to take the square of this, I have to write x three squared. I agree that's clumsy. I accept that. But there are other reasons why this is a, a logical. Um, <coughs> thing to do. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate that by xa. So I'm imagining that as taking those four different values. And that's just a, that's just a, as I say, a notation that's really justified by, well, I mean, even in special relativity, it's, 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 it's important to be able to write things in what's called the tensor <coughs> notation, but certainly when you come to general relativity you need to use what's called the tensor calculus and, and this is how you write vectors and tensors. Um <coughs> okay, uh, so I imagine that I've got two vectors, x and y, and um, I'm going to define a, a scalar product which is different from the usual Euclidean one. And the scalar product I'm going to, it's going to be this. It's x0, y0 minus x1, y1 minus x2, y2 minus x3, y3. OK. So it's, sort of, so it's a quadratic form in the, in the two vectors. <coughs> If we were in Euclidean space, if we were in R4 with the Euclidean metric, then this would be plus, plus, plus here. Okay, and then it would be the usual scalar product. And I'm going to write that uh, in this form. Um, how do I write it? Let me just see how I write it like this. X, A, Y, B, G, A, B. So that's, what, that's how I'm going to write, that's my abbreviated version of this. What the hell does this mean? Well this, remember when you see a repeated index, it means sum over the four values. So this is x0, g0 plus x1, g1 plus x2, g2 plus x3, g3. And then this also gets summed over its four values. So there are 16 possibilities altogether. Yes, my God. But the good news is that most of those 16 things are zero. Um, and in fact, that thing, G, written out as a matrix, is just this. OK, so that's what G is. And if you prefer not to use tensors, but just to write things out in the sort of conventional first year undergraduate way, then it would be this, wouldn't it? So that and that and that, if you multiply them together, you get this, okay, obviously. So, but it's, it's sort of, this is going to be the notation of the future for you when you come to study more special relativity and general relativity. Okay, good. So that's our, that's our scalar product. Now, this, this object here is called the metric.
And, and <coughs> just as in Euclidean calculations, you can use this scalar product to define lengths of vectors. So you do that like this. You probably already guessed how to do it. So suppose you, suppose you calculate x a x b g a b. Then that using that is going to be x naught. And now I do have slightly awkward way of writing things. Minus x one squared minus x two squared minus x three squared. And if these are the uh, components of our usual vector c t x y z, then that would be c t c squared t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. And we've discovered that this is invariant under Lorentz transformations. Okay, so this is invariant under Lorentz transformations, and it's called the it's called the in special relativity, it's called the square of the magnitude. Of X. So we can't say this, we can't use the word length. Because that would be confusing. Length really does mean Euclidean length. So we have to choose a different word which sort of feels a little bit like size or length or something. So it's been accepted amongst the special relativity community most anyway that magnitude is a good word here. So we're measuring the magnitude, the, the relativistic magnitude by taking this, this calculation. Um, you have to remember though that one of the huge different, I mean, sort of arguably the most important difference between this and Euclidean calculations is that in the Euclidean case you get something that's positive definite for for this okay you get plus 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 and so it's the sum of squares and so it's positive definite in this case it's n it can be negative Okay, it can be negative. We're going to explore that. So sometimes people refer to this not as a metric, but as a pseudo metric. So a, a mathematician who wants to distinguish between a genuine metric, which is taken normally to be positive definite, would refer to this as a pseudo metric. It w it's well behaved in every other respect but it's weird that it can be negative. <coughs> um, that's all I need to say. I'm going to draw a picture next. There are a few exercises to do with this. Um, um, in particular, one of them gets you to check that because this is invariant under Lorentz transformations, then so is this also invariant under Lorentz transformations. It's an easy exercise. So this, this scalar product or inner product is an invariant. OK, now let's, let's, that's enough said about that for the moment. Let's now draw a picture and, and see what this tells us. So I'm going to go back to that space-time picture which I drew uh, yesterday, I think it was. So my next, so that this, this, my next section is on causality. We've already, uh, we've already seen some, we had some discussions about causality a couple of days ago, um, arguing about which event comes first out of two events. We had. We had somebody planning to put a bomb on an aircraft <laughs> and so on. Um, 
Let, let's try and put that into an easier to understand framework. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the space-time diagram but put one more spatial coordinate in. So I've still got time coming up the page here and I'm now, I'm gonna, I'm now going to have um, x and y here. Do I want them that way round? I, I don't think it matters actually. Mm, probably it's better if they're the other way round. I'm not sure it matters for what I'm doing. So I'm not drawing Z because I can't. I do want to keep T in the picture. Okay. So there's a Z that's hanging around somewhere as well. And I'm this is the C T axis, so we're in the frame S. I'm not going to worry about any other frame. Okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm doing something simpler, arguably. I'm sticking in one inertial frame, S, our old friend S. And I'm going to uh, <coughs> draw this, right? I'm going to set this equal to zero and draw it. Now, I can't, I can't draw the Z component, so let's, let's ignore that, all right? And, and let's, if you draw the rest of it, if you draw ct squared equals x squared plus y squared, right? So I'm ignoring z. ct squared is going to equal x squared plus y squared. Then I get a cone. And if this is the ct axis, the cone will be at 45 degrees. So it will be something like this. And in fact, it goes on down below too. And so it's a double cone with its vertex at the origin. <coughs> and this is a very famous object, it's called the light cone or the null cone. <coughs> now we draw, and, and this uh, at the origin of any inertial frame of reference, there is one of these cones. And they're invariant under the Lorentz transformation because this thing is invariant under the Lorentz transformation. Okay? So they're well-defined objects. I mean, they're, not, they're conceptual objects. They're not, you, don't, you can't touch them, but they're well-defined uh, objects nevertheless. <coughs> And what they do is they divide, if you now think about vectors in this space, um, the vectors are of three types. You've got vectors that are inside this cone, right? That's one type of vector. You've got vectors that lie along the cone. That's another type of vector. And you've got vectors that lie outside the cone. All right, there are, and there are three completely natural types. This type is where, so if, that, if the end of the vector has um, coordinates c, t, x, y, z <coughs> in each case, then for this one, x, a, x, b, g, a, b is positive. For the cones, for the vectors that lie inside the cone, the, the square of the magnitude is positive. For the vectors that lie along the cone, the square of the magnitude is equal to zero. I should write it out properly. It's not that the vector is equal to zero, it's that the square of the magnitude is equal to zero. And for this one, the square of the magnitude is negative. And they are called, and we will see why uh, during this lecture, I hope, if I don't run out of time, they're called, this is called a time-like vector. This is called a null vector. 
Sometimes it's called a light-like vector. I'm going to call it null, I think. And this is called a space-like vector. So the, so the, nat the vectors are naturally divided up into these three classes by this um, inner product, this, um, this norm. <coughs> and those three classes survive um, any Lorentz transformation. During a Lorentz transformation, the vectors will move, okay? The, well, the coordinates will change. But the coordinates will change in such a way that, that, that the time, if a vector started out as time-like, then in the new coordinates it will still be time-like, okay? And the same for null and the same for space-like. So it's a well-defined, un under Lorentz transformations, this is a well-defined classification. There's a further classification, which is that um, not for these vectors, but for these two types of vectors, the time-like and the null ones, you can have them future pointing or past pointing. Right? So you can have a future pointing time-like or a past pointing time-like. And you can have a, uh, um, a future pointing null or a past pointing null. But in the case of the space-like, th there's no future or past. It's <coughs> so this is, the this is the cone with equation. In this picture, the equation is um, c squared t squared equals x squared plus y squared. That's that cone, the null cone. <coughs> Uh, a couple of exercises. I'll um, I'll say something about exercise 30. And I'll skip over 29 for a minute. That's not a difficult one for you. So for exercise 30, it asks you to. It, it says, if you take a flash of light at the origin, so at t equals naught, x equals y equals naught, there's a flash of light. Okay, what does it look like on this picture? Now, in a, what, what happens in space-time is that if you've got a flash of light, it's, it's a sphere, actually, isn't it, that expands, its radius expands at the velocity of light. If it's, a, if it's a very, very sharp flash, if the flash takes a long time, then it's a sort of fairly thick sphere. If it's a very sharp flash, then it'll start at the origin and then it'll expand out at the velocity of light. So you've got a sphere coming out. What does it look like in this space-time picture? So that was a spatial description. In the space-time picture, <laughs> what's happening is that at any given time, you've got a sphere, but we can't see the sphere because we can't see all three spatial coordinates. It's going to be a circle. OK? So you're, you've got a whole load of circles. As time progresses, the radius of the circles gets bigger. So that's your flash of light. It's this sequence of circles coming up the light cone. Now what we're going to do is suppose, I'm going to explain why these words are used. Suppose x is a time-like vector. We're going to show that we can find another frame of reference, s dashed, in which the spatial components of this vector are all zero. So this vector in that other frame of reference will be the time axis, the t dashed, well, c t dashed axis. Okay, let's show that. So what we're going to do is we can choose, so without loss of generality, we can choose x to be uh, ct x 0, 0. 
So to make the y and z components of the original vector x zero, you could just rotate around. Okay. So that's why I say without loss of generality, we could do that. And it's going to make our calculation much easier in a minute. <coughs> now, x is time-like, so we know that ct squared minus x squared is positive. Right? Because that we've assumed that x is, we started with x being time-like. Time and so, uh, x over t is less than c. So now what we do is we choose s dashed in the, in the standard configuration with respect to s. What's the velocity? We choose it to be v equals that x over so that x has a particular value and that t has a particular value because we've imagined we've chosen a particular vector here so we've got a particular x and a particular t and that ratio is less than the velocity of light so we can choose v to be x over t <coughs> then we calculate x dashed Uh, in other words, we use the Lorentz transformation to calculate the x coordinate in s dashed, and it's going to be gamma of x minus vt, which of course, if v is x over t, then that's zero. And <coughs> so that's got rid of the spatial component of the vector. t dashed will not be zero. I don't need to know what it is. What I've done is I've said that I there is a, if I've got my x here, this is my x vector, I can choose a, um, a Lorentz transformation in such a way that this is the axis c t dashed, right? So it's like a time axis, and that's why we call it a time-like vector. Okay. <coughs> um, And the converse is true. If, um, if you can choose um, a reference frame in which this is the time axis, then this will be true. So it's, it's if and only if, actually. That's sort of clear. OK, now we can do the same thing for the space-like vectors. Actually, that's an exercise, but I'll at least start it for you here. But it's essentially the same argument. Um, <coughs> so let me see which exercise are we doing now. 31. So uh, <coughs> xA is space-like if and only if uh, there's a frame s dashed in which t dashed is zero. <coughs> so in that frame, the vector, uh, the two ends of the vector happen instantaneously, right? There's no time difference. There's no t dashed difference between them. So if the two ends of the vector happen instantaneously, then it's like a spatial vector. It's space-like. The, I, won't, I don't think I need to do that exercise. The calculation is almost exactly the same as this, but of course, um, that's the other way around. So you choose something slightly different here. Okay. If you if you have difficulty, then please say so, and I'm very happy to do it. Okay. So let's look at 32. Uh, 
Uh, it says choose vectors. I think I will do this one. It, it, it touches on one of the questions you asked the other day. X, A and T, A. I hope this notation isn't confusing. Pointing along the x dashed and t dashed axes. Prove that. Uh, X A T A T B G A B equals zero. Okay, let me explain that and, and I'll actually do it for you. We're imagining that we've got some other frame of reference, S dashed. Um, its T dashed axis is not going to be the same as this, it's going to be some vector like this. It's uh, not going to be the same as this, it'll be some other line here. Um, but what's going to happen is that when we calculate the scalar product between the t dashed axis and the x dashed axis, we get zero. You see, in the original frame S, this axis is orthogonal to this one in the Minkowski sense, right? And that's preserved under Lorentz transformations. That's what this exercise is really telling you. Um, so that's the motivation for the exercise, if you like. So it's easy to do. Let me just remind myself how I did it. I'm sure you've probably done it yourselves by now. Um, what are we doing? 32. So what, what we can do is we can choose... So the answer is here. We can choose... Um, the vector x to be um, vx over c x naught naught and we can choose the vector t to be t uh, vt over c naught naught right <coughs> um, those are that Th those two vectors do indeed point along the this one points along the x dashed axis and this one points along the t dashed axis as you can check and then if you take the Minkowski scalar product between these it's that times that minus that times that which is zero so the Minkowski inner product that that thing that I started with after the break the that diagonal matrix 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 uh, is, as you can see, invariant under Lorentz transformations. If two things are, are or Minkowski orthogonal in one reference frame, they will be Minkowski orthogonal in every reference frame. And that's sort of just like Euclidean geometry. If two vectors are orthogonal in one coordinate system, then they're, they're orthogonal in all the others. Okay, and the same thing is true here which is just as well, otherwise it would be chaotic. Um, <coughs> OK, uh, let's see what else. I don't want to do all of these. What I might do next is, so there's an exercise 33, which I'll leave for you. I think I'll press on to the next topic. Um, and then that I may not finish that, but I'll get started. Uh, let's, uh, so the next section is on proper time. We've already discussed proper time and we're going to come and say a little bit more about it. <coughs> um, so as we had in the, um, in the spaceship exercises, the proper time interval Uh, between two events well we give it in terms of its square it's delta tor so that's a that's the proper time and that's some some displacement of the proper time proper time interval delta tor squared is 
delta s. I won't bother with the brackets actually. That's what I mean, but I won't. I'll just put delta tor squared. That means delta tor all squared is delta s squared over c squared, where delta s squared is this standard quadratic. Um, this is invariant, and so therefore this is invariant, okay? And so therefore its square root is invariant. So the proper time interval is, in, is invariant. Uh, and it's called the proper time because it's the time in the rest frame of whatever it is you're doing, right? If you're, if you're not moving, then, then detour is the same as... Uh, delta tor is the same as delta t. Um, now, th th so for any particle moving around in space-time, the proper time. So, so, what does that look like in this in this diagram here? A particle moving. Um, I'll pick a colour. Just a minute. Here we are. So a particle, suppose it starts here, it doesn't have to, of course, it, and suppose it, if it were moving at constant velocity, then its world line would be a straight line, right? Maybe it's accelerating, in which case its world line will wiggle about, okay? What it can't do, this, this curve, it's tangent, it got a bit close there, the tangent to this curve must always be inside the cone, a vector lying inside the cone. You see, you've got cones all the way here. Um, you've got a little light cone there. And the tangent at that point must always be inside the light cone. You've got another one here. And the tangent at that point must be inside the light cone. Um, it's easy to see when it's a straight line because it's tangents the same as the line, but... <coughs> now, uh, with all the, these things are called world lines. So that's, that's the world line of a particle, and it can be <coughs> any line whose tangent always stays time-like. Um, because the particle can't move faster than the velocity of light, okay? And on these, on these world lines, there's a natural parameter. You know how when you've got any uh, one-dimensional uh, subspace of a space, you can parameterize it in lots of different ways. Sometimes when you want to do a, an integral along a curve, you change the parameter because you, it's easier to do the integral and you change the parameter. Okay, so th these world lines have a natural parameter that, that comes with special relativity, namely the proper time. So this proper time tor is a natural parameter. It's not, not that you always have to use it, it's just that it's always there and often it will be the most useful thing. And indeed we've already used it, of course, um, in our exercises to do with the spaceship. So the world line of that spaceship looked something like this. Uh, it was um, hyperbolic and then hyperbolic the other way and then hyperbolic back again. Right? That was what the world line looked like for that spaceship that travelled for 40 years out and back. Where that's a hyperbolic bit then it turns around, that's a hyperbolic bit, then it turns around, that's a hyperbolic bit, and then it turns around, and then it's home again. And this is us. Okay? I should have drawn that earlier. But <coughs> and all along that, we, we were using the proper time as the parameter. 
and in the background we've got the frame s with the, the rest frame time t.